Thank you for joining us this evening for the Australian Centre for Photography and the Magnum Photo event. I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation on whose ancestral lands the UTS City Campus now stands. We'd also like to pay our respects to the Elders both past and present, acknowledging them as the traditional custodians of knowledge for this land. Before I introduce tonight's guests, I'd like to bring your attention to our next Magnum event, the street projections running from the 5th of May to the 3rd of June, with the official opening <coughs> this Saturday. At 5 p.m. at the Burning Rose at 82 Oxford Street, Darlinghurst. These projections are the exclusive results of the Magnum Photos Australian workshops taking place at our partners' premises at Woolara Council. I'd now like to welcome our guest photographers, Vika de Porter and Olivia Arthur, with tonight's discussion led by Helen Bastakopoulos. Helen is a Walkley Award winning journalist who has worked for the ABC and its international station, the Australian Network and SBS. In a career spanning 27 years, she has worked on programs such as the ABC News, The Midday Report, 7.30 Report, Dateline, Late Line and Foreign Correspondent. In that time, she has specialised in international reporting and has covered history-changing events including the fall of the Berlin Wall, the Rwandan Genocide, the Sri Lankan Civil War and the Bali bombings, among many, many others. Helen's research interests include identity, nationalism, memory studies, autoethnography, video journalism and literary journalism, which makes her the perfect moderator for tonight's discussion. For nearly 70 years, Magnum Photos has been providing the highest quality photographic content to an international client base of media, charities, publishers, brands and cultural institutions. Magnum Photos represents some of the world's most renowned photographers, maintaining its founding ideals and idiosyncratic mix of journalist, artist and storyteller. Magnum's photographers share a vision to chronicle world events, people, places and culture with a powerful narrative that defies convention, shatters the status quo and redefines history and transforms <coughs> lives. Magnum Photos reaches a global audience and remains loyal to its original values of uncompromising excellence, truth, respect and independence. Magnum photographers are a rarity and the agency is self-selecting. Membership is a minimum four-year process and is considered the finest accolade of a photographer's career. It has been over five years since Magnum's last activity in Australia. Vika de Porter hails from Belgium and received a master's degree in photography at the Royal Academy of Fine Arts in Ghent in 2009. Exploring the thin line between fiction and documentary, her work spans subjects in Russia, Norway, the United States and Egypt. De Porter captures indescribable, fragile and intense moments with kindness. She joined the Magnum Agency just 25 years old as a nominee in 2012 and as a full member in 2016. Olivia Arthur is a London-based photographer who has worked for many years on the East-West Cultural Divide. She studied mathematics at Oxford University and photojournalism at the London College of Printing. Her work has been exhibited internationally and has been included in institutional collections in the UK, USA, Germany and Switzerland. She is co-founder of Fish Bar, a publisher and space for photography in London. Having based herself in India and Italy, she has navigated the borders between Europe and Asia, Iran and Saudi Arabia. Arthur became a nominee of Magnum Photos in 2008, an associate member in 2011 and a full member in 2013. <coughs> Thank you all for joining us tonight. The ACP is delighted to be partnering with Magnum Photos and our hosts UTS for this event and always our government supporters Create New South Wales. Thank you. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Helen Vatsikopoulos. Welcome to UTS, to the Bon Marsh studio, and welcome um, Vika and Olivia. Um, while we're talking, uh, there will be a slideshow behind us featuring both your work. Uh, and while I'm asking you some questions, people will no doubt remember what we've discussed and look out for your photos. And if there's anything in particular that you want to highlight, perhaps we can refer to them as well. So here we are, yes. So Bika, I want to start with you because I found one of your projects absolutely fascinating. You, you're in search for family intimacy and you went to several countries and uh, you spent the night in people's houses. Now, not only, that's fascinating enough, but how you approach them is even more interesting. You approached people on the street and said, can I come home with you? Uh, which is very interesting. Tell us how that went and how, how did you come up with the idea and how did you actually execute it by just approaching people on the street? Um, well, it all started from my graduating project actually and the first pictures you saw, it was from Russia. <coughs> and um, actually my intention was not, um, like 
I didn't have a concept in mind when I went to Russia. The only thing I knew was that I wanted to take pictures on the Trans-Siberian train, so I traveled with the train, actually. And, um, but I didn't speak Russian, and also I didn't have money to pay hotels. And I knew I wanted to go in the small villages along, alongside the train, but um, I, 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 had to, I had to find a place to, to sleep, and I, there, were no, there were no hotels. And if they were, I couldn't pay them. So I asked one woman I met in Moscow uh, if she could write a letter for me asking if I could spend the night in people's home just because I didn't have money and this thing. So first, at first it wasn't like, I, I didn't think of really wanting to take pictures in people's homes. But like this first night and the second mm -hmm. night, uh, I managed to get in people's homes and it got very interesting. And I felt like, actually for the first time, I felt comfortable with photography because before I was doing street photography <coughs> and I always had the um, feeling of stealing photos of people and I never really felt comfortable. So when I got into these people's homes, it was totally different and I saw that people opened up in a very s short time and I saw that I managed to take pictures I never took before, very intimate ones and I created a relationship <laughs> with people and it became totally different. So then I decided to uh, maybe that maybe this could be my project. So then I decided to like leave the whole Trans Siberian train out and like cons like every day try to find <coughs> a place to spend the night and really focus on taking photos in people's homes. And then after the Russian project, I wanted to do something in a place where I spoke the language because I actually thought that I could be so close to people because. Um, I didn't speak the language because we didn't have this language thing that like sometimes I feel like lang like even maybe without language <coughs> language you get to know each other even better because you have to observe each other in a way to see if you can trust each other or not so I wanted to do the same thing in a place where I spoke and then I decided to go to the States and then I end up in uh, also in Egypt uh, because of an assignment and I stayed there uh, working. So let's just start with Russia. So you, you, you're in a street, uh, you can't speak the language. So what do you do? You just see someone walking down the street and, and pound them down and give them the letter. How, how do you make that approach? Uh, very, it's very simple actually. I just, um, yeah, or just how you say, how you describe it. Uh, I never knock on the door because I, I, I actually observe people to see if I can trust them or not. I think the way how people walk and the way how people move, I think you can see if you can trust them. And I always have my camera out, so if I ask this question and if they only look at my camera, uh, it's not a good idea to s stay with them. So I don't know, it's like, I think you have to trust your feeling. Um, and I, I'm, I have a very direct approach actually. So once you're in their homes and you've relaxed a bit, um, are you uh, are they conscious of your presence there, or how do you capture some of those amazing photos and and tell us some of the uh, photographs you took that surprised you that you actually got them, and 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 how did you go about getting them? That's so many questions. <laughs> um, uh, I'd. I think as I said, like. I think the relationship I have with the people is very crucial in the work I create. Uh, if I don't like, I'm 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 also very surprised about sometimes how fast it could be. Like some pictures, I ha I have up it's um, in the sauna. Like people invite me in the sauna, and I'm f it's fine to take pictures in the bedroom and um, to to like. And I'm only there for one or two hours before I take this photo. So I think it's all about trust. And I think photography, it's um, really, it's not one way direction. I think it's a conversation, even if you don't have language. And I think if you, like as a photographer, it's for me personally, um, it's important to like have this conversation. And yeah, and I don't know, I don't have, I don't have a trick or something. I think it's important to be, or to be my, like I wanna be just myself. And, <coughs> I think for me it's important to be in these projects, uh, to be there first as a person and then second as a photographer. 
Well, some of them were obviously very, very trusting because some of the portraits you got were very intimate. So tell us about those and um, how you felt about taking those. Like, yeah. Um, like, I, I don't, yeah. <laughs> like this one? Well, that's not very nice. Like this one, for example? I yes. don't know, I'm just, it's, it happens. Like, um, and taking photos of people sleeping and it's like it's a very it's it's a very normal thing to do in a way because I'm I'm with them for long like it it like a night it doesn't seem long but if you're with one person without language actually it's quite long mm -hmm. uh, so you just be together and for I think they see me as who I am but as Bika but who Bika who has a camera all the time so this camera just comes with me and if I go with them in the sauna at that point they already trust me and it's normal that I have this camera with me and I, I, I just keep on taking photos. Yeah. And what are some of your favorite photos that you took in Russia? In Russia? Uh, I like the sauna pictures, yeah. But yeah, every night it's, an, it's a new story and every <coughs> night it's a different thing and it's always a surprise and it's quite interesting because I like the idea as well, um, like if I see people on the street, I never know, especially in Russia, um, people all dress up very nicely and you never know where you will end up, if it would be in a poor family or a rich family. or It's always a very big surprise because I don't knock on the door. So I just find people in the streets and then every night is a new story. And I actually kind of like the experience I have. It's very important. So, not being able to speak the language and communicate with them, but being in their home, what sense did you get of where they're at in terms of where Russia is today? In terms of, uh, you know, communism collapsed a long time ago, uh, there are very, very rich oligarchs and very, very poor people and they don't have that system of communism that, that yeah. helped them along in their daily lives. What sense did you get about the way people are living today there? Well, I, I think you, I, I can't have these conversations, right, about politics. And, yeah. and yeah. like in, in Egypt, it's even more because I was there when the revolution is going on. Like from 2011 till 2017, I was intensively le uh, working in Egypt. And you feel, like in Egypt, you feel that the revolution is going on. Everything is out, like... People are on Tahrir Square, like protesting, but I, I don't want to capture this. But in a way, you feel this in the homes, like you feel the tension. Um, and I don't know. I, I think I, I actually like photography that is in the sh that is captured. Like I don't think us as photographers, we always have to really capture the moment. But I think we can say a lot about uh, without like really photographing the violence. We can say a lot about it without really showing it. So yeah. in Egypt today, though, you did get a sense of the tensions and, and the political situation affecting people, even without speaking the language. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. In what ways in the household did that show itself um, to you? Is it with the women? Um, For uh, example, like, I, have, I, I don't know if it's on there, but I have an image of um, the pyramids. Um, um, shot through a very poor house and like the people around the pyramids are becoming more and more poor because they were living out of tourism and tourism isn't there anymore so it's getting yeah worse and worse mm. but then in Egypt I actually that's another story um, I actually had the frustration that this revolution wasn't in my photos so and I also had the frustration that this my work like in the beginning, I only show like I was really shooting pictures and um, I was making this book and I had the frustration that I didn't really show Egypt in the right way. Uh, and I showed Egypt from a very Western point of view. And that's actually why I did this. Then I decided, this is a pyramid picture. Actually. That's right, so you returned and got them to write over yeah, the photos. Because I wanted to have another voice, like an adding voice into the photos about, and people start to write the comments on the pictures, what they think about the photographs. And then they also start to talk about politics sometimes. And this is when this I start to have the revolution in the pictures as well. But they also question photography and religion. And yeah. 
and you also had some of those comments translated into English. Were you surprised? All of them. Yeah. yeah. Were you surprised at the sort of things that they had written? Um, I actually went with a translator, of course, because I wanted to have this conversation with people, and um, so uh, we had long conversations about the photos. About I actually went back, like, to kind of explain. I made a dummy at home about how my book would look like, and. On a certain moment, I decided I don't want to publish this book uh, with only pictures, like this very Western point of view book. So I went back with the dummy to ask other Egyptians, not the same Egyptians, but other Egyptians to write on the images, like their thoughts. And um, I, w I was surprised, actually. I thought, because I wanted to include also people who would never uh, let them be f being photographed. So, and I thought that people who were very conservative, I thought they would steal the book or like wrap the book up or like really don't like the book. But because I asked for their opinion, they kind of, they really loved to share their opinion. And even though they hated photography and they didn't like my book, they really liked to write that they don't like it. And they liked to have this conversation, which was, this was very surprising to me and very nice. Because people start to have, like people with different ideas, start to have with each other, like people who would never talk to each other, start to have these conversations about all these different topics um, with each other on the book, which is, for me, was very nice. And this is now the work, this is the book, so I don't have just the images anymore. Fantastic. Yeah. Olivia, um, I'm very interested in, in your work, uh, groundbreaking, certainly at the time, where you went to Saudi Arabia um, and took photographs for a book called Jeddah Diary. I'm really interested in how you actually came up with that idea, uh, a very close society, and especially for women, um, and how you found being there. So I didn't exactly come up with the, the idea. I mean, these things kind of grow out of various different, you know, one thing leads to another. I actually went to, I actually went to Saudi to teach a workshop. Um, and I, I had, I had, uh, I was teaching women. You can only as a, as a woman, you can only teach women there. Um, and um, obviously, as a photographer, in the back of my mind, I was sort of hoping that I would take pictures, but I didn't set out to make a book about Saudi for sure. I just wanted to know. I was just curious, you know. And, and before I went, I, I tried to research a little bit. Like I tried to find out, like, what is it, you know, what, what might I find? You know, I'd also also spent a lot of time making work with women already, looking at the sort of east-west divide, and, and also kind of going into people's houses, and a lot of it was quite personal. Um, and I had no idea whether I would find that or not. So I didn't you know, make any promises to myself or, or to anyone else. Um, but I, I, in fact, I even spoke to a couple of photographers I knew. I mean, at that time, I, you know, I tried to find photographs just on, you know, online, mm -hmm. see what I could find. Like, nothing, nothing, nothing. And I spoke to two photographers I knew who'd been there, both men, actually. One of them told me how um, he'd had like he'd been a sort of appointed a government guide that had come round with him. Um, you know, everyone he had to sort of climb out of his hotel room window and like go in and like hide in the back of a car to like go out and see the place for himself. And the other one said to me, "Why don't you just uh, take a burqa and, and use a spy camera?" So I was like, "Which is exactly what I would want to do." Um, so I just went with an open mind and I went to see what I would do. And I, 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 I first of all taught and I, you know, I worked with the students. And in fact, through them, I learned quite a lot about what it's like to take pictures there because um, photography had been, or photography in public had been illegal until very recently. Until I think just sometime before, I don't know exactly when it was, when, when that stopped, but just, just before I was there. And, and people would come up to you in the street if you went out with your camera and would tell you, you know, it's not allowed, it's illegal in this country. Um, you know, all sorts of things, or, or just, you know, saying you can't do that, it's not, you know, our culture doesn't allow that. Um, and uh, and my students, I mean, I, I also had, you know, they, they had various different problems. I mean, one one of my students came on time, like, I couldn't go out and take pictures because my driver was um, <laughs> not free, or my husband wouldn't let me go out, or... Uh, but, you know, it was, it was kind of me, so I learned, so I learned, first of all, through them, what it was like and what that kind of process was and then I slowly I made friends they'd invite me to their house for, for a meal and I'd meet their family and, and I'd take some pictures and 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 then I asked them specifically if I could photograph them at home and, and I was always quite open with them that I wanted to be able to show the pictures that they had to be you know 
they had this idea of like pictures that you could take and just keep, you know, I could just take take it and keep it for myself as a sort of memory or, or I don't know, just show it to other women. Um, but I, you know, always wanted them to know that I wanted to be able to show the pictures. And so um, gradually I started making something, but it was complicated um, because I started making, I started telling them this, so they would cover, they would wear their, well, they would cover their hair or they would, you know, sometimes they would wear an abide depending on, on, on how they, you know, what their personal views on that were. And, um, and, it's, and it's very problematic because you start to make pictures that are not real. And that, for, you know, that was really difficult for me. And, and, and yeah. it's something they're quite used to there. So on TV, for example, um, you'll have like sitcoms um, where the women will be wearing a headscarf in the house, which is not real, but because that's the only way they can put it on TV. And so you have this kind of like semi-reality. And, and in a way, what I ended up getting into there became, I mean, it became about sort of exploring that that line, you know, what can you show, what can't you show, what's, what's real and what's not real, and it's, it's extremely complicated, and it was very difficult for me to then put those pictures out, because you kind of, you know, as a complete outsider, go away and say, this is what this country is, and I didn't want to say that, because I, you know, anyway, still didn't really know what that country was. So were, were you able to, to get authentic pictures in the homes um, mm. that you could publish? Were there people who trusted you? So, um... Yes. Um, so I have some pictures where they're covered. So I, I did that, and it was some of them where they're wearing full abaya, niqab, like totally black, and 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 those are not real, of course. And those are those are kind of they're kind of funny. I mean, to me and to the women who I photographed, we thought they were quite funny, and we kind of liked them in that way. But they're not real. And then so I started trying to find other ways, and I sort of. You know, maybe there's an arm that goes across, or someone's got that. You know, th you know, there's there are other ways to try and be subtle, but it was incredibly frustrating. Like as a photographer, it takes away, it sort of took away all the freedom of the photographer to kind of explore with the camera. Um, so you're thinking more about you know what you're showing and what you're not showing, and, and than actually just making a picture. Um, but I, but it felt important as well, and it felt uh, um, to be able to show that. I mean, I, you know, there was a point where I was ready to say like. Let's you know leave it. They they want to be private. You know who am I to come in and try and like expose this world? But I also had friends who said um, no no like you go and show them like show them that our lives are not as bad as they think they are. And that was they were very insistent on that. So you were able to do that because if they're inside and they're covered, uh, their lives are as bad as they. Well, no, you see, they were very. This I mean, I had some quite interesting discussions with them, and I would try to push them to like question. And, and, and they would say, look, our lives are not, you know, look at us, we have our freedom, we go, we do what we, you know. Of course, and I'm not, and I, I, what I, one thing that I find very difficult when I talk about, you know, the work that I've made or my experience in the place is that there are a lot of different, there are a lot of different people and there are a lot of different, uh, like, little worlds there, right, and different opinions on this, right? Some people are very conservative, some people are less conservative, and some people you know, a conservative in certain situations and less conservative in other situations. But, but I did, ha you know, I did m I remember these discussions, like, where I was trying to kind of push them to discuss those, those issues. And then sometimes I'm like, who, who am I to push them to question their lives if they, if they feel happy with their lives? So I also, you know, it, I, I kind of stepped back from that. It was, not what, it was not what I was there to do at all. I was just there to try and, just to explore. And so when I put the work together, it became really important that I didn't try and make it as a, as a sort of, this is what life is like in Saudi Arabia. It's just a kind of, it's a strange um, journey that I went on and the kind of experiences that I had and the people that I met and, you know, pictures where I've had to cover, like, had to cover the faces with a flash because I got too close and they didn't actually want that to be taken outside. And, and so you re-photographed some of those photos with a glare. Yeah, exactly. So, so I spent, the more time I spent, actually, I started using different cameras and I'd use like very little cameras that became, it's a bit more informal and um, um, so I could take more casual pictures of them which had this sort of more intimate feel um, but they didn't want me to use them and I was always quite open about which pictures I wanted to use so um, yeah I had to find a way to cover the faces and I, I basically what I did is have these little prints made in a lab there and, and photograph them with a with a bright light or like a flash that, that reflects on the face and kind of partially covers it up so you can kind of partially see and partially not. So did you find some of the men there were a bit protective and a bit 
um, um, suspicious of you. I didn't meet loads of men there, honestly. <laughs> I mean, I mean, really, you know, I spent a lot of time with women. I met, I met some men. The fathers or the husbands. And I didn't, yeah, I didn't meet many fathers. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I met, I met some, I met some, but you know, really, it's very, it's very segregated. So you, you go, you hang out. So the, the mum will be there, the, the, the girls will be there, or, um, you know, the father, I guess he's out work. There was, you know, they have, so you have in the house, the sort of design of the house, you have the house, you have these very high walls so that like none of the neighbours with their big houses can look into your courtyard or whatever. And then you have a little, I mean, not all of them, but quite a lot of the houses have this, have a little sort of um, room, like a room that's outside the house. So for example, if they have sons who like might, you know, so like, they can go and hang out with their friends there and like smoke their juice pipes and whatever without having to enter the house. So they the can women. Yeah, but so the women of the house is for the women. I mean, not entirely, of yeah. course, but they can, you know, have their time there. So I, d I mean, it's not that I didn't meet men, but I didn't spend a lot of time with men. I also later went to parties and I met a sort of, you know, another scene where, you know, more liberal sort of scene where. What were parties like? Um, they were, I mean, I, the first time I went to a party, I, I must have stood there in absolute shock because I had not quite imagined. It was, it was like going into a, you know, it was on a compound, so you go in an on, inside a compound, you know, whatever. It was like, a, it, was, it was a huge space, it was like a warehouse party, like going into something in East London, and it was like music and dark lights and, and, and everybody like dancing and kissing, and I was like completely shocked. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Okay. You also went to Iran. I was what was around. that like for the women there? And can you make sort of comparisons? Very difficult, very difficult to make comparisons. I find I, I, um, they're very different places, very different places, very different cultures. Um, I, so I, very, I always hesitate to even like try. Um, just, I mean, I, I went to, yeah, I find that, I find that very difficult. I, I, I think. The women in in Saudi, there's more money, and the, and the money has a big influence, and that has, you know, that is obviously, you know, becomes a part of the girls defending their lives, and becomes a part of that. In Iran, I, you know, you meet a lot more people who who don't have money, and you also have a much much older uh, culture, and you know, you have a, you have a culture that not so long ago was much more open, you know, where women were much stronger. You have very tough women. I, I was very, you know, I, I my my mind, the women of, you know, Iranian women are very tough, very strong, um, very opinionated, and and, and and I said, in Saudi, I think, you know, it's a much younger culture. I think you, um, they live more in a bubble. I, I feel like, yeah. Okay, interesting. Are you thinking of going back to these two places because Saudi, especially, there's big changes there. Women are allowed to now go to sports matches and cinemas and soon drive. I know, yeah, I don't know that they give me another visa, but it's possible. <laughs> <laughs> did um, they did they express to you that one day they would one day be able to go to a, a movie theater or something like that? No, you know, it, you know, in these houses, like every single room has satellite TV in it. Oh. So, like, <laughs> you know, and they. So that's how that's how you feel, yeah. and and it, that is that for me was also quite interesting because they, it's not that they're not aware of what the rest of the world is like because they watch it, you know, it's on constantly. I mean, I, f I found that quite weird as well, like constantly on in every room on these TVs, just like all the stuff, like everything that we watch. Because um, as well as uh, doing uh, those intimate portraits in Russia, as you mentioned, you also uh, replicated those in the United States. And where else did you go? In Cairo. Um, what were the Americans like? Well, actually, many people ask this question of comparing the different countries to each other. And to be honest, I don't really, I don't want that. I even like, I don't really care because I think, for me, it's not about like first my work. It's not about who is who is the Russians or I want to talk about the Americans or about Egypt. Um, it's more about my journey, this is one thing. But at the same time, I think my work is more about um, the similarities between all of them. And I'm very much attracted to the night and to like being inside the house and being uh, like how people are if they're not anymore in the streets. Like, because I think we all, me, myself as well, like if you're outside, I think you're different than if the 
if it's getting dark, if we come inside, if we prepare to go to bed, um, if you're with our family, we all want safety and want love. <laughs> and like, I think it's very, it's very universal. And for me, it's more about this. And um, what, wh where did you go in, in America? Uh, were there particular states? I traveled all over. Um, well, not well, almost all over. I did eight oh. trips and I would always choose like two big cities. For example, Atlanta down and New York, mm -hmm. and I would fly into Atlanta and I would fly out of New York, and then I have three weeks to like cover like then I would travel and do small towns in between, and I did this kind of trips eight times, so eight big trips. Yeah, and it was the same approach, mm -hmm. just approaching people in the streets. Yeah, well, yeah, and I I really wanted to go to small towns, so. Um, in the beginning I hitchhiked and then uh, the last three trips I rented the car uh, and that's when I started to take the landscapes uh, but yeah like I would just want walk around run around to find like I don't really I try to find people that I'm curious about and try to find people that I'm attract that I'm feeling attracted to and I, I that I want to know how they live in their house and this is how I, yeah, yeah, do it. You said in, a, in an interview that you always follow your feelings mm. um, when you are working as a photographer. Um, uh, and that photography makes you concentrate on the world. Uh, yeah, you said that. I yeah. saw you. It was on YouTube. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's true, yeah. <laughs> so what... Um, what, what what does photography mean to you? It's a way of life is it for you, really, because you're not chasing the political stuff at the moment. You're interested in those really intimate portraits. But what are you trying to say through your photography, I guess? How do you want to reflect the world? That's a big question. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, you know, I journal journalists want to change the world. They want equality. They want to give people a voice. It's very selfish, I think, what I'm doing, uh, to be honest. Um, and the work I'm doing now, it's, it's. Uh, I mean, I'm further away from this. Um, it's. I feel like it's very personal, and it's. Um, I don't know. It has to do with how. I don't know. I, I get interested in something, and then I try to kind of research it in my way, and and. Um, I think photography helps, like. I like to be amazed about things, and I think mm -hmm. like photography really helps me to yeah look closer, maybe more concentrated, more. more. But uh, I like if you ask me how I got into photography and why I'm a photographer, I really don't know. Like, <laughs> I it really helps me to be here, I think, and to kind of uh, when I make work, when I start like like when I take pictures, I find it very important not to think about the outcome. I think mm -hmm. I don't I don't want to think about the audience when I'm taking pictures. But then when I make a book and it's very like very clear in my last book that I made, I start to think about the audience and then I start to question what I was doing and then uh, the works is changing because then I start to select the pictures and uh, yeah think about publishing and then it's not anymore about for myself. Uh, but yeah, in the beginning, it's really very selfish. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to throw another quote at you. Um, you said, it's sometimes a lot easier to share personal things if you know you'll never see this person again. You haven't been back to Russia, have you, to any of those people? You've never contacted them again? No, but the people in... Russia was complicated, but people in the States, they through Facebook and in Egypt as well, uh, we are in contact sometimes, but I like, I really like the idea of creating this one moment, and I think, um, for me, like the the um, both for me and for the people I photograph, the fact that we both know that I'm going away the next day and we probably never see each other again is quite important because um, because it's this one moment. I think we share more than if we would know that we will see each other like every day. 
because we don't have to think about the people like we think about this moment and I, I really like this idea. So just leading on from that, that sometimes it's easier to share personal things because I'll never see this person again. You've said that one photo that you had revealed a suicide letter a woman had written but kept hidden from her husband. Yeah. Tell us that story. That's in the United States. Oh. Um, yeah, we were sitting on her bed and she, like a lot of people show me um, more than, yeah diaries like uh, what they were writing and yeah it's, if they want I take picture picture from it and she she was not very good mentally anymore I mean she didn't feel well and she wanted to commit suicide before yeah she didn't do it luckily so it was an old suicide letter and she never told her husband her husband was in the next room uh, yeah but this is one of the stories. Why do you think she shared it with you? Because she never see you again. Or maybe we became like we became friends in this short time, and I probably shared some things with her as well that no one knows. Am I like it's a conversation? Yeah, it's I, I think photography. I mean, for me, it's all about trust. Yeah, but not only them trusting me. I also have to trust them. Olivia, tell us about um, the project that you undertook um, that one of the Magnum founders had begun um, uh, photographing refugees. So I can't remember the name of the person who did it originally, but took photographs of refugees in post World War II Europe. And of course, re you revisited it because now we have the biggest movement of people since then. So tell me how you found that, you know. The, the task of retelling something and revisiting. So yeah, so it wasn't exactly revisiting, it was George Roger who made this work, Children of Europe, after World War II. Um, ex uh, basically, he, um, he traveled in, in Europe looking at the situation of children you know, in the aftermath of war. Um, and for Ma at Magnum, so as part of our 70th celebrations, we uh, several photographers kind of revisited work but didn't I mean it wasn't so much about revisiting the same things it was more like making work that kind of reflected on something that had been made in the past so he traveled across Europe and I um, stayed in the UK I think um, I mean these questions are quite uh, you know pertinent in the UK at the moment and 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 um, so I wanted to look at this idea of like the children who come to the UK recently and who are um, you know who are waiting for their refugee status or, or, or you know who are recently um, receive their refugee status and they're kind of in a way the children who could be our you know our future or who, you know and who you know maybe may, may find it harder to be able to come to us in you know this time of change where we become a more closed country um, and so I went to Glasgow and I worked with an organization in Glasgow who, who um, helped people with their um, you know, accommodations and, and and I went to photograph the, specifically the children um, and uh, yeah, I met people from all, I mean, actually mostly non-European uh, migrants, but it, there was a combination. There were some European migrants, um, I mean, from, from all over the world. And, uh, Middle East? Yeah, so there, were, there were Syrians, there were um, uh, from various different countries, from Zambia, from Gambia, from uh, Ethiopia, from, from Iran, I mean, from all over, all over. And um, it was... Yeah, it was amazing to see, I mean, to, to photograph them. I mean, just, the, you know, they're also children. Yeah. And so uh, it was great to photograph them in, in that sense. They, you know, they, they, wanted, they wanted to make a fun picture, and I, I, you know, I enjoyed that. It was not about making something serious, and it was like this one kid with this, mm -hmm. you know, this teddy bear that they brought from Kyrgyzstan, which was literally twice the size of him. Mm -hmm. and, and they brought it all the way with him, or this, uh, you know, or this girl, just, just, just having, sometimes just having fun, and it was just about, like, I wanted it to be very simple. Um, yeah. and, and some of those children almost directed the photographs themselves. They chose the way they wanted to be depicted. Absolutely. That's yeah. really interesting. And, and what's that, is that sort of reflecting their dreams or um, hope? How did you? Yeah, well, just them, just them mm -hmm. as individuals. I think it's, um, so I, I've more recently been doing, so sort of, I don't know if the pictures are there, if they're in this at all or not, I can't remember, but um, the black and white ones, you know, this is this work that I've been doing which takes quite a different approach. It's much slower. It's, you know, essentially making portraits, um, 
I work with large formats, so I'm either sort of on a tripod, very slow, um, or with kids because they move so much, it's very difficult to do the large. Yes, yes exactly. Yes. Uh, yeah, so she's uh, jumping for joy. Yeah. yeah. Oh, there's another one. And that's another one, Charlie, as well. Um, and Beautiful. So, these, so with the kids, actually, I had to use flash a lot because, I mean, you, yeah, on the, it's like, so it's a very old traditional camera, you know, where you sort of like sit still, you focus it, and again, you get it all ready, and then you put your film, and then you make a picture. I mean, you know, kids don't sit still long enough for that, mostly. Um, but, um, so, I, so I started using a flash, which was a lot of fun, actually, because it means that they can express themselves a bit more, and they could choose, I could, they, you know, they could choose where they wanted to be photographed or what they wanted to be photographed with. So it becomes, it becomes a bit more, yeah, it's about them rather than me imposing something. And, and, uh, yeah. What sense did you get from them about the dislocation? Um, you know, they were kids, so it was more about, it was more about me making a photograph of them to, you know, to say celebrate them, something that they would enjoy, than, than me trying to get them to talk about you know, politics or, or that kind of thing, or, or even you know, their, the sense of their journeys. And, some of them, actually, I would be given information about their journeys or their status that the kids didn't know or didn't understand, and I didn't want to go there. I, it was it was about them. It was about making an exhibition with them where they would be, you know, have their pictures on the wall. So I didn't kind of try to make it about them. Because most of the news that comes out of the refugees' communities is always bad news, and it's about victimisation, and it's about how traumatised the kids are. It's very interesting that you chose to to pick them in a, in a positive um, positive light, was that something you specifically wanted? I mean, uh, yeah, not, not necessarily sort of in reflection in the way you say it, but more in, in that way that they're, you know, they're kids and they're like, it was, a, it was sort of a treat for them, you know, to be photographed. They made, it made them feel special, you know, and particularly <coughs> with this big old camera, it's kind of like, who is this crazy woman? What is she doing in this, uh, you know? And, um, but they kind of liked it. They all they all find the camera very curious because they've never. I mean, it's it's you know it's huge yeah. and it's at both down like this. And then they kind of it's, it's a sort of it, it, something fun for them and, and and something you know. And then they get a print and they I mean they get prints for themselves, but they also get to be in an exhibition and they like it. It's interesting. You know, both of you are, are talking about photography in that sense of it being uh, slow, uh, a photograph that takes a big camera and takes time and says something specifically. In a world where the journalism and the photography is fast and getting faster and the 24 hour news cycles and we take an image and it's a tragic image and then we move on. Um, you must be, uh, uh, what's the word, you must revel in the fact that you can do this in a world where everything is so fast. Is that? How you feel with what you're doing at the moment? I feel like I'm getting slower. <laughs> that's good. Yeah, that's maybe, good. Yeah. That's good. Is that is it's that intentional? I guess it's intentional to a certain extent. I think um, I, lo I, I, I like the slowness. I think it's uh, photography can be very, very fleeting and very and in and you know in its fleetingness can feel very cold and and the slowness you know it lets you know it, it lets the kind of experience live a little bit. You you kind of go through a process with people who there's, there's, takes away from that idea of you know that feeling of stealing a photograph, and I really enjoy that to move away from that. Is that the way you you feel, Baker? Um, yeah, I, I I never really had a problem with everyone taking pictures. I think it's totally fine that everyone takes pictures, and but there's like a, a shift in how we look at photos. But uh, at the same time, I think there will be another shift. I think people again long to other kind of photography, like to slower photography. I think because, like we, like if we just look at the news, we see all these images, like cruel images, and we can't really. I mean, we just look at them like fast, fast, fast. And I think there is a need again for slow photography, and I feel like it's changing again. I hope. I mean, yeah. But yeah. yeah. Do you think this is part of uh, a backlash? Um, in, in my field in journalism, it's very, very fast. It's 24 hours, 24 hour news. You always have to update it and it's got to get fast and fast and fast. And you've, by the time you get to the next cycle, you've forgotten what the original story was about. So in the future, those very fast photographs will be there to signify an event. But your photographs will be an opportunity to sort of 
you know, sort of breathe in the time and what it reflects. Is so do you think your photographs will outlast maybe the ones that are, you know, snap, 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 snap? I don't know about outlasting. I think um, I'd love to think people can come back to, you know, slower ph photographs because they kind of they find something in, you know, in them in that kind of the kind of the quiet of the moment or the quietness brings you, you know, makes you look at it in a different way. But I don't know that the, you know, the, the news photographs that are very fast are still va valid and they're still a record yes. of our time yes. and we'll still look back on those. I, I don't think that. Yeah. I think they did so different these things. I don't know. If you I think, I, yeah, I think it's about connection. I think, for peop I think people need to relate to the people on the photos. And often the photos we see in the news, uh, we don't really relate to the people we see, although we are the same, right? Yeah. So, and I think it's important also in journalistic photography that, like, instead of taking pictures of the other, mm -hmm. we photograph. We don't photograph the other, but or ourself through the other in a way. And this is sometimes something I miss and some oh, sometimes. And 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 I wish it was more like we were more I wish we would photograph more ourselves. Um, but I think it's going and and maybe with slow photography it's more that's maybe more what we try to do. But maybe your photographs will be more relatable in a way because uh, the front page of a newspaper will have a child that um, um, you know lost its parents in a bombing or something tragic, but people in their bedrooms. And one of the photographs where people setting settling down for the night. Maybe it was Egypt, and there was um, uh, lots of beds on the ground, and all the sheets had come out, and all the blankets and. And you think, oh wow, this is how people sleep. And I've got a bedroom too, but my bedroom's a bit different. Oh, their bedroom's really interesting. I mean, that sort of thing is very, very relatable, and it says a lot about how we live. Yeah, but it's also two different things. Yeah, mm. like we need to talk about what's yeah. happening in the world as well, of course. And uh, so we can't just show uh, like arty pictures. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, it's yeah. We can't ignore, I mean, it's important no, to have can't, good journalistic images as well. Okay. Yeah. I think we might go to the audience now and get some questions from the audience. Maybe, can we dim this light maybe a little oh. bit? Uh, <coughs> <coughs> if you get any word somewhere in Egypt or something, like four years or something? Uh, in Egypt? Or somewhere, like that. I travelled back and forth for six oh, years. back and forth, because yeah. I thought four years was a different place in my life, you know? Oh, no, no, no. I'd no. find somewhere to sleep. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's better. But yeah, I was like, no, yes. It doesn't yes. make kind of sense. I thought it can't be too No, no, no. I went, I did eight trips, and it's always three weeks a month. Uh, right. Well, three weeks is still quite a long time to find the place. Sometimes for it's... For the it, night, or do you stay a week? <coughs> no, one night. One but night I have night. to say, like in 2011, the re revolution just started. It was quite e well easy yeah. to find a place, and the last time I, I tried to find a place to sleep in 2016, it was impossible, like yeah. almost impossible. I think maybe in three weeks I found two nights or three nights, because yeah. people were very uh, like who think I'm a spy, uh, like very there's no trust. Uh, very difficult atmosphere to work in. And obviously various countries are more trusting than others. So I, I don't, yeah, well, I think everywhere you find people, like people in the core I think are very similar, uh, but it's the things around, like, the, for example, when I was in Egypt, there were this advertisements on TV <laughs> that were saying not to trust foreigners. Uh, so it, <coughs> it makes people not to trust each other, right? Mm. Um, but it's, yeah, yeah, there's an atmosphere. And small towns in America, are they very <laughs> trusting? It depends where, really. Um, I, I always thought in, like, the West Coast it would be um, easier because people are more yeah. left. Yeah. But it's not true. Like, I actually had a better time in the very conservative uh, Bible Belt. <laughs> but maybe it's also because people, like, for example, it, like, people take me in for different reasons. For example, one night, in the States with a family, we, they wanted to pray, so we prayed, and um, they were saying that 
like they were talking to God and they were saying they took me in not because of me but maybe I was an angel so people take men for different <laughs> like not always because they really <laughs> trust me <laughs> yes. have you ever done a runner a runner like a runaway yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you mentioned that your, work, your current work is quite different from the work that is shown here. Can you talk about your current work? Yeah, some of, well, some of the pictures are there, but it's all, also three years ago. And what I'm, it's m more um, like some of the work I took in set is up here. Maybe I can talk a little bit about this. Um, I was invited in a um, town in the south of France to do like. Um, to make a book and an exhibition in a short time in one town, town. and in six weeks, so it's not much, a book. And um, so I was walking around and see what I would do, and the curator actually wanted me to stay in people's homes, but I didn't want to do this. Um, and um, I was looking around, and suddenly it felt like, because I had this feeling that I really needed to have a result, so I started <coughs> to look at people in a different way. So I started to look at them as objects more or like subjects and this is really not the way I want to look through pho like to photography so uh, I I didn't I couldn't take photos so I was walking around in this town without really taking pictures and I tried I was walking around at night and after 10 days not photographing I was trying to find a solution and I decided to see the people more as um, maybe like I had this atmosphere in mind I looked through the city through my eyes and I had this very dark idea about the city. Not, it wasn't the real city, but like I started to have this idea. So I decided to see the um, people as actors more. So then I invited myself, like I find people on the street that I liked and I invited myself into their homes and then we created, like I used them actually, I, I used the reality to talk about my own reality. And so it's like more fictional in a way, but it's quite true because it's it's their lives in their home. But sometimes I would change things, and then after set I made a film, a short film as well, in the northern part of Norway, and it's it's again like I was there on the residency and I filmed the people of this little town, um, and it, it was during the winter time, so it's dark the whole day, um, so. It's a film about, it's documentary fiction. It's a film about how people deal with the everlasting darkness. And I, again, invite myself into their homes and then we would make a scene and I, combi I, I combined the portraits with um, like portraits or picture, um, like film of the nature, like harsh nature. And I thought it was fiction and I showed this film in a festival in this little town and the people came and they thought it was very real. So yeah, and then now I do a collaboration with the girl I met in the south of France, uh, in the south of France, in Paris, during a life lab something with Magnum. And I don't know, this work, it's really a collaboration. Like I use her again to, like I have this atmosphere in mind about Paris and how I, I had a very dark atmosphere in mind and I found her on, like in a striptease bar and now we, I, I, I started to take the portraits of her, only portraits, and I don't know, we, ha we do this collaboration. I use her and she using me because she wanna be portrayed and we have a conversation about how she wants to be portrayed and then, yeah. So, but there's, there's many. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, yes. Um, so I have a question about to meet uh, Arthur. Um, of course, we mentioned that pictures are, we found ourselves into pictures and so my question relates to this. Um, I'm queer, so when I see queer people in photos, especially in countries that are well not known to be very accepting, I'm always curious about that and I spotted um, um, I guess a lesbian couple making love and also I think a, a trans girl that you took pictures of. Could you tell us the story and how the situation is there? So these pictures are made um, in, in India, in Bombay, um, and uh, that came out of, a, I mean, so I started working on this a couple of years ago. I, I started work, it was actually a commission I had to make work with an Indian photographer, 
both in Brighton in the UK and in Bombay in, in, in India. And we worked together, basically, we were asked to make work about um, LGBT communities. That was kind of the brief. And I, um, we, and, and so we worked here, we worked, we, we did, we went to Brighton, we, we Brighton has like got a huge um, LGBT community and we, we made a lot of portraits there. And then we went to Bombay and we started making portraits there. Um, and in fact, how we divided up the work in the end was that he became more interested to work in Brighton and I became more interested to work in, in Bombay. I guess that's also part of the, you know, that's how photography works a lot. Um, and so we, we did it, we divided it up that way. And in India, I was also very fascinated to um, not just make it about the LGBT community because I felt that was a bit narrow and I wanted to talk more broadly about sexuality. I mean, I think there's probably only very few pictures here and... and um, they probably are mainly from that community, but I also photograph many people from, like, from any, a, a, you know, anybody. I, I, my, the way I said was that I, anybody who wants to talk about their sexuality, I, I, want, I want, would like to make a portrait. And I had, I photographed all sorts of people. Um, they were. Um, I, I was also doing a lot of nudes because I felt like, I mean, it was something. If people wanted to do it, it was, you know, some, of, of course. Um, became more representative of them and their sexuality and like it became about be people being comfortable in their skin I, I think that was how I described it and I, I, if they were comfortable in their skin and comfortable to be photographed that was um, something that I wanted to capture and, I, and, and again I was using the big camera and it's a slow process so it becomes quite collaborative and I explain what I'm doing I'm they know what kind of picture I'm making of them um, and the situation with the two girls um, so again, those, the two girls, I mean, I, I had been put in touch with them and, and I sort of came and I explained the project and showed them some pictures and they said, okay, sure, we'd like to be photographed. But, but I didn't ask them to make this kind of a picture. It's a sort of a process. So I started photographing. And, and then, you know, they start to undress and they start to make, you know, they make this picture because it's, it's a sort of process together. And at the end, they said to me, you know, we never, we never thought we would make that picture, but they were really happy that they did and they... You know, they were they were very happy then for the picture to be exhibited. In fact, we were not allowed to exhibit it, so which was then another more complicated story because the festival that was showing the work um, was worried that we would uh, get shut down. Um, so we had to take it out again, <laughs> but which made me frustrated because the girls wanted to have the picture shown, um, mm. and it's not, I, I want to. I, I'm still working on the, the the project, and I want to find a way to be able to bring to to, to you know show the work properly there. Um, Yes, this kind of follows on with what you both are talking about. How, can you describe, both of you, the process that you go through to get consent, I guess, formalized consent, that you can publish it as you want? Well, I, I, I don't know. We, I guess we can answer it separately. No. I, 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 um, I personally don't um, get people to sign anything um, for consent, and people, are, people often ask about this. Because um, I think that if you get people to sign, the only person you're protecting is yourself. Mm -hmm. And it's not fair to people they don't necessarily understand what it means. And I, I, I mean, I, I have to um, get consent forms signed uh, on, on, sometimes when I'm doing assignments or, or often when I'm doing assignments, but not for my personal work because I think it's about, you know, it's about trust, as Vita has been saying. I think if they trust me and, 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 you know, we trust each other, then we shouldn't have to make this kind of legal document. Yeah, I'm the same. I never ask, actually. Uh, and also, it kind of breaks the... Um, it's it's a weird question to ask. Like, mm -hmm. you, you built this relationship of, of yeah. trust, and then you, you get this letter that is showing that you want to use these pictures for this and this and this. So it means, like, yeah, it's it's a very weird thing to do. I had to do very it. Yeah. yeah, it's fair. Yeah, and it breaks kind of this relationship. And then, do, do you have a legal right to use those photos, then? Well... Yeah, they're inside the house. I mean, I'm just trying to understand. Yeah, we are. Like, I, I'm, I think we are both very honest on what we're doing. And in Egypt, for example, I don't speak the language, and it's very complicated. Um, so in Egypt, I was traveling with, also because it was too dangerous for me to, like, um, travel by myself. So I would travel with uh, a girl who spoke um, Arabic. So we would travel around, and we find people, because it was very difficult to find people, so we would find people together and she would explain and more people like some people would let me into their house but then once we asked the question of photos 
and then we really were honest on I want to make a book and an exhibition a lot of people said no so we de I didn't stay there uh, so uh, but then this girl would leave and I would spend the night by myself but um, I, I, I'm, I'm very open on what I'm doing and people say yes and I think after I mean yeah I never had a problem uh, and set and the work like the, there's some pictures there but it's more sexual and uh, it was kind of an assignment and the festival of this town sh they really wanted me to have this paper signed uh, and I went back to everyone and no one had a problem and the pictures were really shown in this like in this little town uh, with people naked and very very personal and but no one had a problem and the exhibition was very nice because the people came uh, to the exhibition and very yeah nice atmosphere yeah, I mean, I think something that I mean, I always do is, is I mean, I, I keep, do keep in touch. I don't keep in touch with everybody, but I actually have ways of contacting most of the people I photograph. So, if somebody wants, so for example, the festival. I think I think in in India when we showed some of these photographs, the festival actually did con you know got into touch and and asked people for permission. And that's different. I think that's then an organisation which needs this permission. They can then ask for it. So if you have, I, I have you know almost always a way to get back in touch with people if they need it. It's not from me. Uh, any more questions? I actually had, uh, sorry, somebody else? I actually had a question for you. You said when you were in Russia, that in those small villages, um, that they would talk quite freely to you. Talk? Sorry? They would talk quite freely to you. We have a a saying in English called the cold country to the strangers, which sometimes you get into a railway carriage and a terrible tragedy has happened to you and you pour your heart out to this total stranger. Did you find when you went to Russia to those small towns, they felt like that or were they all talking together about their problems? So when you arrived, it wasn't the cold country. <laughs> It was a communication with somebody from outside. Yeah, it was in Russia. I didn't speak Russian, so I didn't talk with the Russians, but more in the United States. Um, I, I, I often found that the people who took me in um, were quite lonely, and they were actually looking oh. for mm. someone to talk to, yeah. um, or a friend, or someone to share. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So it's a cold country with strangers. That, that's what you felt like. Yeah. Say, uh, I noticed your books were published not by Magnum. Magnum uh, doesn't publish books. Sorry? Magnum, Magnum yeah. doesn't oh, publish books. Publish yeah. no. no. No, it's all like, I've got a, I still books on there. We, we, yeah, we have a shop where and the books get sold, yeah. but yeah, yeah it doesn't actually it. publish no. itself at all. Okay, one, two more, and, and yes. Um, sort of off the back of that other question, asking about people sort of pouring their hearts out to and things like that, did you ever feel an overwhelming need to help one particular person, or did anyone ever ask you for extra help, apart from just, you know, comforting and understanding, I suppose? Um, of course, not everyone is really sharing yeah. their whole lives. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> um, um, I like it's a difficult thing. I find uh, I often I'm often in situations where it's difficult to go away the next day, um, especially if there's children uh, involved in a difficult situation. Or um, but actually, people they never ask for money. Um, and I never pay as well, but sometimes I feel like I have to help them in a different way. Sometimes I do, yeah. But it's not like I, w it's not that I would pay, f I don't want to have the feeling I pay for pictures. Mm -hmm. So, but it's like it has nothing to do with the work I make, I think. It's more like what we do to help each other <laughs> more than, yeah. Um, uh, but it be, like these people become people I care about. Um, yeah. Yeah. 
There was a question in the back first. Um, I'm just interested in sort of the crossover between fiction and documentary. And, um, do you think in documentary there's sort of more of a movement more towards a collaborative sort of approach when you're photographing a subject and then a lot more aware of what's going on rather than you sort of being a fly on the wall? Uh, yeah, well, I think in photography, and if we look what's happening now, I think many photographers are starting to have this shift a bit and like this collaboration and find it important. I think I, I'm not exactly, I think many question, maybe it's also because photography is everywhere that people yeah, so start people to are kind of People are kind of going out and, and exploring yeah. a lot more, I mean, the kind of more traditional ways of using photography are yeah, very <coughs> saturated and so people are kind of exploring everything, I think. Yeah, I think like there is, yeah, there is a way of telling a story through yourself more than you really need to tell the, like documenting what is actually happening. So yeah, people explore more and more and it's, yeah, it's a very interesting time, I think. Yeah, I mean, there's also something which is, you know, a little bit more complicated, which is the sort of in-between bit of that and that documentary photography, you know, there's this it's not, it's, not, it's not as clearly defined as we would yeah. think, and, and what is sort of fiction is sort of documentary, and, 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 and you know, it's, maybe it's more an acknowledgement of that, and some people yeah. are making real fiction, but, and some people are, are you know, just making, like, I, mean, I think documentary always has that element. You can't, as, you're, as, as the photographer, take yourself out of it, particularly when you make work that's very close, and so there's that, uh, it depends how yeah. far you want to push the idea of fiction, but there's, there's always an element of, like, the influence and... and yeah, it's also about how you define what you make. Like, I, actually, I don't think my work is fiction. It's just I'm saying that I'm. I just want to be honest to the audience as well as how I work. Like, I want to say that sometimes I stay like the Russian, American, and Egyptian work not at all. But like the newer work, I just want to say that I'm that it's that I'm collaborating with the people I'm working with. It's not a story. Like, yeah, it's not totally fiction. It's, I think many photographers. It's a process. Yeah, they talk yeah. about towards the sort of you know this kind of portraiture that goes into <coughs> documentary that goes into fiction, and actually there's, it's. It's not anymore. It's not clear cut, yeah, and it's yeah. Um, um, yeah, it's about a process. Oh, can I just say it's such an honour to see you guys and hear you talk tonight. It's uh, amazing, inspirational work. What would be a dream assignment for each of you? What would be your an assignment that with no limitations, you, you can do anything you can. What would that be? Where would you go? <laughs> I think, I don't know. <laughs> All the funding, I mean, I think we do. Money, you don't have to worry about uh, time frame. Just assignment is then a funny word for it, because I suppose for us, like, assignment is normally, like, doing the work that somebody else wants, whereas we make, well, we, I guess we kind of try, we go, like, we talk about assignments and personal projects. Um, um, yeah, for we, we, like, work on our, I suppose the work, it's always the work that you're currently doing that you want to explore and, and, yeah. and, and uh, I don't know if, if we have, if I have like a dream, like I'm always like exploring several different things and working on them and hoping to finish them. That probably means that you are doing it, you are doing your dream project. I suppose to a, I suppose yeah. to a certain extent. <laughs> 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 it would be nice that people would uh, like, would pay money for doing it. Yeah, <laughs> but <laughs> we, uh, yeah. the assignments are normally the ones that fund the other. Yeah. Yeah, just on that. Um, so, if you say um, between the like dissemination of what you do, say between like a book and whether you um, publish them digitally online or whatever, do you find that the book is more um, satisfying than the than the online, or which thing actually sort of takes precedent in the way that you uh, do a, a project or something, which is more has, has more weight to it, basically? I mean, I, person, I mean, I, lo I, I love books. I think that they're, they're, I mean, they're beautiful objects. They're, it's amazing to, it's, I think it's my pr preferred way of looking at photography. Um, there's also something um, that's great about the kind of uh, finality of a book. So you make it and it's done, and even though you always want to change something after, it's kind of done. Um, and that sort of, I think that experience that you make at a time is, 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 very special, but I think, I mean, I also have my personal issues with the photography 
book market these days because it's sort of gone. I mean, I, I say that myself. I'm, a, I'm also a photo book publisher. I publish other people's mm. books as well as mine. And, and but it's uh, yeah, it's a complicated it's a complicated process because you also a photography book's a very expensive thing to make, and therefore it's a very expensive thing to buy, and therefore you can only reach a certain audience. And I find that I have an issue with that, and that's something that I'm trying to figure out before I make another book. So I think um, we should leave it there. Thank you. It's been wonderful having you here.